What's up everybody? We're going to continue looking at the most common AP Physics test questions. Today's topic is going to be that of rotational motion. After taking the test, if you can do me a favor, come back and if you see any of these, give me a thumbs up. If you don't see any of these, give me a thumbs down. So one of the things you should definitely expect to see is kind of a net torque or a balancing problem. So for example, let's say we have a stick, let's say we have our fulcrum right here, and you're gonna place a force, say in this direction, and they say like, where should you place a 2F force in order to balance it out? So let's say if we placed a 2F force on the left, we want that to be half the distance. If this distance say is distance D, then if we place a force of 2F on the left, we'd want to push down from a distance of 1 half D. Now you could also place a force of 2F on the right at a distance 1 half D, but this one you'd have to be pushing upwards, right? So 2F would have to push upwards halfway. Now sometimes they may give you just like a, like a circle here, and maybe you place a force this way, so in this case, remember it's force times this distance, let's just call this r, like the radius of our circle. And that's how we'd produce a torque. So a lot of times you'll see um, a force here, let's call that f, maybe you have a force this way, let's call this 2f, and maybe you have a third force, and this one, perhaps this one's at like an angle. So maybe it's like this, right? So remember when something's at an angle, to find the force, you want the force to be perpendicular to this radius here. So in other words, depending on what angle they give you, let's say they give you this angle theta, then the distance that's perpendicular, if we draw in a triangle, that would be this distance, f here. We'd call that, let's say this is f, this would be f cosine of theta. So they may ask you, you know, what is a fourth force to put it in equilibrium? or they may just ask you for the net force. Either way, you just add up all the forces. Here, let's go ahead and do the net force for this one. So this one's producing a counterclockwise force. This one's producing a clockwise force. They're in opposite directions. And this one down here is also producing a counterclockwise torque. So if we find all of those, we'll do this one first. That would be F times R. We'll do this one here, that would be plus F cosine times R, sorry, cosine of theta times R. And then this one here, it's in the opposite direction, so we'll go minus 2F. That will equal um, like the net torque, right? F net. So if we simplify this, this would be, let's say, F cosine theta minus F all of it times R. All right, let's look at the next one. So question number two is a conservation of angular momentum problem. So remember, angular momentum L is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity. And when momentum is conserved, you can change one thing and then change the other. So for example, the classic example is the ice skater. So you have the ice skater with their, with their arms, say, outstretched, and then they bring them inwards. They're gonna, their rotational velocity, since I decreases, the ro rotational velocity should increase, so they're gonna start to spin much faster. Or same thing, like if you have a diver, someone jumps off, okay, and they start rotating this way. If they curl up in a little ball, they're gonna rotate much faster because their moment of inertia decreases and therefore the angular velocity increases. So one of the keys to understanding this is just remember that inertia itself is proportional to two things, the mass of the object and then also the radius squared of the object. So in other words, arms out, big radius, arms in, small radius. Body, full body, big radius, curled up body, small radius. So we're gonna see this play out in the very next question that we do. So let's move on. 
So question number three is the merry-go-round problem. And there's really two of these questions that, that are fairly common. So the first one is, well, let's imagine that we have like uh, a person standing on this merry-go-round out here. And let's say we have another person, like a little kid in the middle, and they're both rotating around. And one thing they might ask you is to compare the angular velocity and the linear velocity. So the key thing to understand is that in one revolution, they both take the same amount of time to go around. So if you understand that, then this question is fairly easy, right? So for example, angular velocity, remember that's the number of radians per second. Well, one revolution, you're gonna go two pi radians. So if they go the same, take the same time to go two pi radians, then the angular velocity is gonna be the same for both. Now the linear velocity, well that's telling you the meters it travels in a second, okay, or the distance per time. So in this one, if you notice, the guy on the outside, they travel a much bigger circumference compared to the guy on the inside. But the time is the same. So that means for the guy on the outside, V, is greater the farther you are for the guy on the outside, right? The farther you are from the center, the greater the circumference that you have to travel. In fact, if they ask you to calculate that, that would simply be two pi times the radius divided by the time. Okay, for omega, you would just go two pi divided by the time. So the second merry-go-round problem they might ask you is, well, let's say our guy's here, and let's say it's moving around, right? And maybe they ask you, okay, our guy's gonna move closer to the center. So this one we kind of just talked about in the last previous slide. The inertia, since you're clo going closer to the center, the inertia is going to decrease. And since the angular momentum stays the same in L equals I omega, that means if I decreases, omega is gonna increase. Now, if they ask you to solve it, you just do something like this. You say, well, L initial equals L final. And so you'd go I initial omega initial equals I final omega final. And so whatever the, I initial is, omega initial is, and then use I final, and then you can find omega final. So the last merry-go-round question you might see is, let's imagine our guy is um, at rest. Let's say they stand here. Let's say this starts at rest. So we'll say our V initial is zero here. And this time the guy's gonna start walking around in a circle. So if they start walking, let's say clockwise, then the merry-go-round's gonna have to go in the opposite direction, counterclockwise. And this is because the initial momentum is zero, so that means you must have a final momentum also equal to zero, right? And so that means, let's say, the momentum of the guy has to be equal to the opposite momentum of the merry-go-round, okay? And you can just solve that similarly to what we just did. All right, let's move on to question number four. Question number four is going to be analyzing the energy of an object rolling down a ramp. So if you recall, if we have just a simple object just sliding down a ramp, then in this case you have gravitational potential at the top, and at the bottom you have like what we'd call linear kinetic or translational kinetic. Now instead, if you have an object rolling, and oftentimes they'll say rolling without slipping, so if that's true, then you still start with potential energy and it's still turning into translational kinetic, but it, there's also going to be some rolling kinetic as well. And so in this case, at the bottom, you'd have both translational kinetic plus rotational kinetic. And a common question you might see along these lines is, well, comparing a simple object sliding and another object rolling, which one's moving faster? Well, hopefully you see in case one, 
all of that energy goes into translational kinetic. In case two, the rolling case, some of it goes into translational and some of it goes into rotational. Therefore, the second case would be moving slower or take more time depending on how they ask the question. Let's look at the opposite of this. So the opposite would be, let's imagine we have an object that's rolling at the bottom with a certain velocity and compare it to something that's, say, moving with the velocity and it's just going to slide up. So this is really the opposite here. Like maybe they ask like, which one goes higher? So in this one, the one that's sliding up, well, that has some translational kinetic, right? Based on 1 half mv squared. And that's going to turn into potential energy here. But when it's rolling, it has the same translational, because we said it's going the same velocity, but it also has an additional rotational energy. So since it has more energy to start with, it should have more energy to end with, and therefore have more potential energy at the top. And therefore go higher. All right, let's look at question number five. So question number five is one of their favorite calculations actually, and this is just simply angular impulse. So for example, let's say you have your wheel and you're gonna push with a certain force and a certain radius and they want to know oh, what's the uh, change in velocity, for instance. So in this case, you just use um, torque times time. So you'd go force times radius, and then let's say they give you the time. And then that's just going to equal to the inertia times that change in velocity. So they most likely give you all that you need, like the inertia and the force and the radius and the time and you just find the change in velocity. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Just be on the lookout for it because they absolutely love, love, love this question. All right, so that's my five most common questions for rotational motion. Please let me know if any of these show up and good luck.